Hi, guys. So just a little thing. I'm not at Trustpilot anymore, actually. Um, <laughs> for the past five weeks now, I'm at working at uh, Falcon Social, another Danish startup. But it's pretty much to do the same thing, because my job is a, a high-scale team. So I used to work at Trustpilot. When I joined Trustpilot in Copenhagen, there were um, 60 employees in Copenhagen. And in the span of two years, we made the company grow from 60 in Copenhagen to uh, 350 in Copenhagen, New York, London, and Melbourne. Um, Today I'm going to talk about recruitment, early recruitment for startups, and, and why I believe it's critical to actually go for the culture fit, the personality fit for the organization, more than the skills. So let's see how this works. Yay, it's working. Cool. Uh, who am I? So Nico, French, uh, 35 on Monday. Uh, I've been doing recruitment for nine years now. Uh, both internally and externally. I started in the, in the agency, so headhunters at the start. Um, then I moved into uh, startup recruitment because I think it's extremely interesting. It's, uh, you, you, you grow something, you're part of something, and you can create the culture of the organization. Um, over the past nine years, I think I recruited uh, about 1,200 people uh, in countries like France, South Africa, England, Ireland, uh, the US, Russia, uh, Australia. Denmark, obviously. Not yet Lithuania, so if you guys are looking for a job at some point, you can come and see me afterwards. I'm sure we can manage something together. Um, so why I believe this is like critical? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a massive switch in the organization um, and in the industry in terms of people used to just look for skills. Like you're looking for a developer, he has five years experience of development, uh, UX, Java, whatever, you would recruit the guy. Um, but more and more we realize that uh, the personality match, the, the, is it going to work or not, that, that's the critical part to make sure that you have like a, uh, a successful recruitment. So let's start with the um, scary part. What happens when you recruit the wrong person? And, and it happens quite often. Um, pain. Pain, pain, pain. That's what happens when you recruit the wrong, the wrong candidate. Um, on average, they've done studies, on average, uh, wrong hire is about six months salary. That's the cost. That's just the, the money cost. That's, and, and if you're like early at the stage of recruitment for your startup, that's simply you cannot afford. But that's just the money. You need to look as well in terms of time, the time that you have spent to recruit the person, the time that your team has spent in training this person, the, the time that, uh, that, that you invest in this person that you're not going to get back. I mean, you can always get the money back. Time is the thing that you're never going to get it back. Another thing that's, uh, that's super critical is that a wrong hire is probably going to kill your team spirit. It's probably going to come in and then destroy your culture and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to suck the blood and the energy uh, out of your organization. It's business, so actually this part here was supposed to be under this one, but uh, it happens. Um, it's business critical to not, not fail on the first hire. I mean, you have four people, you're a young startup, you want like, uh, the next person. If you fail this one, that's it. I mean, it's, uh, you can put uh, the whole business in jeopardy. So obviously, and then again, Captain Obvious on this one, but the first people of your organization, they need to be the best one. They need to be like stellar, both in terms of skills, but especially in terms of personality match. So let's look at how do we make sure that we don't do mistakes. Uh, before we start this, there's something you need to, to know if you don't know that already, but recruitment, it is not an exact science. We're dealing with people. It's not mathematics. It's not physics. It is people dealing with people. So making mistakes happen all the time. And then at some point, even if they tell you you should never go for the, for the gut feeling, at some point it's a judgment call. It is. And, and you, you have to trust yourself. So the right recruitment, you just always start with what is your need? What are you looking for? Um, but more importantly, especially for a startup, not what you're looking for now, but what do you want the person to be in six months, one year, uh, 18 months from now? Your company is going to grow. Do you want somebody that's going to match 100% of the need that you have today? Or do you want somebody that's probably at 50, 60% that's going to be able to grow with the organization? You need to make sure, basically, that you have your scope of the role completely right. Be aware of the unicorn, uh, unicorn and purple squares. So this is like um, an industry uh, talk. Basically, it's like uh, when I was working at Trustpilot, um, the head of uh, product management who would come to me and say, uh, so I'm looking for uh, 
uh, UX developer. He needs to have five years' experience. He needs to speak six languages. Uh, I need to relocate him from Copenhagen, but he needs to have experience from San Francisco, and he's going to work for free the first six months. Purple squirrel. This does not exist. So as a, as a recruiter, you need to manage your stakeholders. You need to, to explain to them, dude, this is not going to happen. Like, know the market. Understand that don't go for, for, for crazy unicorns. They don't exist. Give yourself time and proper recruitment process. So what, what's, a, what's a proper recruitment process? Uh, interestingly, again, like in most organizations, you talk to any manager, he's going to tell you, yeah, I know recruitment. I mean, I've done it all my life. This is easy. I've recruited people. I talk to people in the pub. It's a little bit like having an interview. Nah, not really. It's actually a proper job. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit specific. Um, in terms of the process, what, uh, what we do at Falcon, uh, so today, Falcon, we have 160 people uh, in Copenhagen and in New York. We just raised $16 million, and we need to recruit 180 people before the end of the year. And we need to open offices in Berlin and Budapest. So we're going to be a little bit busy. But it's not because you're busy. The first mistake is always to think, oh my god, I'm busy, I need somebody for tomorrow. Yeah, and then you're going to recruit, you're going to jump on the first candidate, and you're going to recruit the wrong person. And you're going to pardon my French, but you're going to fuck up the, the whole organization just by trying to go faster than what you should. So um, a proper recruitment process on average takes between, between four to six weeks. Step one, you're going to sit with your hiring manager, you're going to sit down and you're going to define what's the need, what's the position, uh, when do I need this person to start, what's the salary that we can offer for this organization, for this position, uh, what are the, the skills needed, uh, what type of background, the education, uh, all this stuff, you need to happen, it needs to happen at, uh, at the, first, um, the, the, the first meeting. Then you're going to have um, what we call the sourcing. So um, you have the, the active candidates, so you post your job somewhere and they're going to apply to a position. I don't believe in those anymore. I believe is that somebody is good at their job, they're happy where they are, and they're not looking for a job. So I believe today that uh, posting jobs, it's, uh, it's more marketing and communication than anything else. I mean... Uh, Good candidates, usually, if they're good, they're working and they're happy. So we become, I mean, they become like passive candidates and we need to go and hunt them. So the, the, the talk before was all about LinkedIn. Use LinkedIn, abuse of LinkedIn. Just go find candidates, reach out to them uh, and, and create like a pipeline of, I would say for one position, you need to have on average between 10 to 20 candidates that you're going to screen on the phone. Um, you can probably spend 15 minutes on the phone with those guys, gather all the information that you, that you want, that you need, related to, uh, to uh, the need that we defined uh, at the start, um, and then you're probably going to invite five of them for a face-to-face -face interview. Face-to-face uh, -face interview, well, just standard, I guess, interview, be yourself, ask the questions, but turn all the time, and then this is coming after in later slides, um, turn, turn all the time, the skills probably takes 15 minutes to check if somebody like, uh, was a developer or did marketing or did sales, I mean, did you do this, clack, clack, clack. But the personality, that's, that's the culture of the person, the value of the person, that's, what it, that's, the, that's the tough part, that's where it gets tricky and, and actually more interesting. Be yourself when you meet the candidates, there's no point uh, trying to be something else because that's anyway gonna later on when the person join that's simply gonna again destroy what you've what you've tried to build so we said it's important to recruit um, some some people that are aligned with your culture and your value and then what's your culture that's 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 actually a, a really tough one what's your culture what's the culture of an organization how do you define it? If you talk to probably 100 people that work in startup, they're going to tell you, yeah, we're fun, we're flexible, uh, we, we, we like to grow fast. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not culture. That's like, it's startup. That's the industry. That's the standard of the industry. So it's, it's the exercise here is really to sit down. I don't know if you're, if you're alone or if there's like more than five, ten people working in the company, but sit down and really define who do we want to be as an organization. Why are we doing what we do today? What's, what's the drive? What do we want to accomplish? And, and following down from this, cascading from this, you're going to look into, okay, what defines this culture? What made us work together and, and wanting to achieve all this? Um, at the end of uh, the slides, normally if everything worked well, um, I brought the deck from Falcon Social, our culture deck, and I'll be showing you guys a little bit of what we believe is who we are and how we use that um, to talk to candidates. 
um, create the communication deck, the culture deck, critical. I mean, I always tell people, you have, I mean, you, you meet candidates or you meet, um, sorry, startups, and they tell you, yeah, I have great values, we have a great culture, that's great. Did you put it on paper? Do you have some deck, some information that you can show me what is your culture? And more importantly, do you actually act on this culture? Because if you say that you have values, but you don't act on them, they're not values, they're hobbies. And that doesn't work. It's about enforcing and following the culture that you want to have in the organization. This one is fun. So, now that you know what culture you got, who you are, what you want to be, how do you culture interview? Well, first of all, you don't call it an interview anymore. Nobody calls it an interview anymore. Yeah, if you work at HP, IBM, or those big, big players, for them it's still interview, it's still those massive process, and it's, it's not flexible. We don't call it interview at Falcon, we call it a chat, a discussion. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to meet you in face-to-face. -face. It's not an interview. An interview is putting me in a position of power. That is not recruitment. Recruitment is a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more like flirting, I'd say. You flirt with the person, the person flirts with you, you fall in love, and then you start this beautiful love relationship that is starting a new job. And you need to be in love with that. So, what I do at Falcon, um, I invite them to come and meet us in the office, and I usually tell them that uh, we don't have enough space, we don't have meeting rooms, which is the case because we're just going too fast, and I take them for a walk in Copenhagen. And, and already you're killing this, oh my God, there's pressure, I'm in a meeting room, I'm, I'm sitting with somebody and then he's gonna judge me. No, we go for a walk, we grab a coffee, I talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing, their position, uh, why they want to have a discussion actually with me, why are they looking to, um, to potentially move jobs, and I really try, and this is sometimes dodgy and could be a little bit illegal, but I try to see, um, so what do you do when you're not working? What are your hobbies? What's your passion? What makes you get up in the morning and, and be happy and smile? Um, do you follow football, rugby, basketball? Uh, and, and so do, those are very... Some, some, in some countries it's illegal to ask those questions because they would say, okay, you're actually uh, asking uh, discrimination-based uh, questions. But it's, it's really how you ask them, and it's really like being outside of the office, you just create uh, a trust um, relationship with the candidate, with the person that you're meeting. And you need to know all this behavior, personality trait. You need to know that if the guy or the girl is telling you, um, uh, I play tennis, uh, I do rock climbing, and I play pia I mean, piano alone at home, this person is probably an introvert. This person is probably not the best team player because they didn't have an experience or they're not used to, to play in a team or do uh, team activities. At the same time, if the person is saying, yeah, I'm the captain of the football team of my university, okay, cool. So you're a leader, you want to be a leader, you want to develop yourself. So it's all those little things, little nuggets of information that are not on the resume that you want to go for. But beware on the like, yeah, there's some questions you simply can't ask. Body language, extremely important, uh, whether you're sitting across, but even, even if you're walking next to the person. I usually, when I walk with them, I usually try to work much slower, and I see if they're gonna walk at the same speed as me, or if they continue on their straight. And then that tells me, like, uh, uh, are they aware? Are they, are, they, are, they, are they looking to have a discussion with me? Are they want to take the leadership of the conversation? It's, it's all those little things that are extremely important. Another one, the references. Always take references. Not really to check uh, where they're good at working, but check um, how does this, this person behave in a team? Uh, what did they do um, with uh, a bad manager? Uh, what happened when, when, when it was tough? Did they crawl down under the pressure, or did they raise and went uh, above and beyond? All those things, again, behavior, behavior, personality. Super key, more important than the skills. The skills, I mean, you recruit a guy, you see on a CV, I've done five years of, the, of uh, like Java development or whatever, okay, you've done five years. It's pretty easy to check. But are you an asshole or not? That's the real thing. And you can't have assholes in your organization when, when you're a small startup. Doesn't work. Making sure it works. Once you have the right person, culture and onboarding. So normally you've, you have your, your culture deck. You have your values written somewhere. You're gonna use those to keep on engaging your workforce. They should be proud of where they work. We, we use um, here at, uh, at Falcon Social, we're creating a tool called the, the Nine Box, where um, we rate people on, uh, on their productivity. 
which is pretty simple. I mean, everybody should have a KPI in an organization, whether it's you work in sales or development or marketing. And then we, we measure the engagement of the workforce. Um, are they following the culture deck? Are they, are they above and beyond part of what we want to become? Do we believe that they are the right people, the right falconeer? And then, then we have a talent map of the organization and we can see whether our people are engaged or not. We can train them, we can develop them. You would, you would realize that people that are happy in an organization, I know it sounds completely obvious, but it's related to the culture fit or not, people that are happy will perform better. They will bring more, they will go above and beyond. Those are the guys that are going to work 60 hours per week with a smile on their face. And just because they belong and they're happy to be there. And this is something that you need to... People don't become happy in an organization, and culture of an organization is not going to change. This is why recruiting for the culture is more important than recruiting for the skills. I hope it works. No, okay. So I will exchange, or I can share, if you guys reach out to me on the... On, uh, on LinkedIn, I can share some uh, the culture deck of, uh, of uh, Falcon Social. I think it's a, it's a very, very interesting uh, tool to have. And I have 8 minutes and 55 seconds for questions, if you guys have questions. Hello. I don't know, man. Here, this is the mic. <laughs> Great, great speech, thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering what about the culture for very, very small companies at the very early stage, like two or three people working yeah. here. Sometimes these are your friends, and sometimes you just need to get down, try and build the product, develop the ideas, etc. So it looks like what you're saying is very good, would be nice to have, but how do you suggest to go about that where, like I said, two or three people, you just sit down and start writing the culture thing so that I think, first of all, I mean, if you guys are friends and working together, there's already a culture fit somewhere. Then it's just a matter of putting a word on it. Okay, but if you're looking, like, okay, uh, hire two or three other people? Yeah. Actually, when do you start building things like culture decks? Uh, you start from day one. It's actually, I mean, the thing is that from day one, like, uh, so you guys are three, four people. It's very fluffy. It's in the air. But the reason you guys are working together is because there's a cultural fit already, personality fit. So you see what, what do you think you guys... What makes you guys work together? Is it the drive? Is it what you want to achieve? Is it the fact that you guys are all crazy about uh, basketball? Is it uh, uh, the product that you believe is just like, wow, it's amazing we're behind this product? Um, that's why I really wanted to show you the, the, the culture deck because I, I can show you afterwards if you want the culture deck. So it's worthwhile having such a thing even at the very, very early It's stages. extremely important to have it very, very early because the first employees you're going to have, as I said at the start, you, you can't mess it up. And this is, when they come in, they, this is like a concrete, tangible paper or, or whatever, slide that says, this is who we are, this is what we want to be. Do you believe that you can belong to this? Because if not, I don't want to waste your time, I don't want to waste our time. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Hello. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> Thanks for, for the speech. I have a question. So, uh, when you are creating a startup, everything is like from your pocket. And you need some additional people, for example, who can work for you for free or just, you know, <laughs> volunteer for the specific skill or whatever. And of course, in, in, in the process at the beginning is exciting, then it gets less exciting because work is more and more and other obligations as well. So have you had that kind of uh, situation, basically? Interns? Uh, interns or people who are like, yeah, yeah, I want to work for this, but after two months, no, then more. Because... It happens. Yeah, yeah. How do you, you mean, how do you keep them engaged? Or yes. do you make how, sure at the start that they're engaged? How to start them engaged and, and be in the culture yeah. and what to give the benefits of, of that. Not like you'll have a share of this company. No, no, no. no. Well, we, so um, at Falcon Social, we have a lot of interns. A lot, a lot of, uh, of interns from uh, CBS, the, the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, they, so even if it's only an internship and they're not getting paid, they go through the same recruitment process because we want to make sure that they align with our, uh, with our values and our culture. So they're going to meet four people of the organization in two different interviews. Um, that, that's just to assure that, okay, they're, they're you know, on the same page as us. How do we keep them engaged and, 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 and uh, following us on, on, uh, on the values? 
without getting paid and everything. I think it's just the projects. I think it's, it, it boils down a lot to uh, middle management. Who are they going to report into? Are they actually developing those people? Because if it's about having interns to bring coffee or do photocopies, that's, I mean, uh, nobody would do that. But we, we engage them a lot. We give them lots of responsibilities. And most of them, within one year, if they're good, they, they, they just get a job with us. And it's a win-win because they already know the company, they already know the culture, and they usually bring lots of new students together. But it's, I, I think it's really about engage, engaging them, empowering them, and giving them more and more responsibilities quickly. Kids are smarter as this year. I mean, it's just, yeah. But I think so, yeah. Hey, man. <laughs> uh, I want to have a question about how to remove them. How to remove people yes. from your culture. So, so how to exit people from an organization? So what are, like, I never, people? I never done that. When I do HR for eight years, I've never fired anyone. No? No, no I did, yes. I mean, it's, it's just, it happens. Any tips on how to see the signs when you have to remove them? The red flags, um, so the nine box thing that we're doing really allows us to, uh, well, put people in a box, which doesn't sound good, but um, we, we see that if people are like very low performers in terms of productivity, but they're really engaged, they're really following the organization, that probably means they're not in the right job. We want to keep them because they engage and they're passionate and, and they, they, they bleed Falcon Social. But they're not in the right job. So maybe it's a sales guy that we're going to move into account management and so on. The worst one, the worst case scenario is like low performers and not engaged. What we do, uh, we have a chat with them, HR has a chat with them, and then HR and the manager, we're going to put a performance plan in place. So you've got one month, those are the KPIs that you need to hit on week one, week two, week three, week four. If it's not happening, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's, it's not happening. Something interesting that I do now at, um, at uh, when I do an offer, when I sign the candidate and I do an offer, and it's something that came from uh, somebody I met at LinkedIn Talent Connect last year, a guy from LinkedIn. When he hires people, he goes like, uh, thanks a lot for joining. Um, let's face it, I don't think this is going to be your last job ever. You're not going to be with us 20 years. Uh, I want us to have the best ride. We're here to develop you. We want the best for you. We hope that you want the best for us. And let's keep it like this from the start. And if from the start you tell people, yeah, I mean, you're not going to be 15 years in this organization. If you are, that's amazing. It doesn't happen anymore. Managing expectations. Yeah. Nicolas, how do you um, recruit people, let's say, from the artistic side, the artistic people? Designers. Yeah. We do it a lot uh, at Falcon because we have a very beautiful product. Uh, so it's a lot on the hiring manager, actually, on this one. I mean, in terms of recruiters and HR, for us, we can check the personality test. Uh, we can look at uh, what does the person do outside and everything. But I think on this one, it really needs to be a love story between the, the hiring manager, so our head of design, and the person that we meet. So we look a lot at their portfolio, what they've done in the past, where they've worked, and everything. On this one... We're still putting culture above skills, but I think it's really one of the ones where we would be able to close our eyes a little bit on the culture if it's really the best designer in the world. Because they don't come around that often if they're really good. Values. What do you mean? No, they should have the same values. We are one organization. If you don't have the same values, if you don't share our values, you are not getting inside the door. That's as simple as this. But it's, it's the tricky part on checking people's values. And that's why you want to have one person doing recruitment inside. Don't use agencies. They can't know who you are. They, they know that they want to sell people to you. But internal recruitment, somebody that that's, is your culture ambassador, is the first person that, that any candidate is going to talk to. And he needs to share your values, and he's the one that, by doing it every day with tons of people, he can check if you're aligned with us, you're aligned with us, you're not, you're out. Yeah. Uh, if someone uh, doesn't fit completely culturally, have you ever tried to convince of your values, or you just say, that's, yeah, yeah. that's part? Yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, what you need to see as well is that, again, I take the example of Falcon, but Falcon is a Danish company. I'm not Danish. Dan I mean, like every country in the world, there's a very specific culture. So you're probably never going to be at 100% exactly aligned with the, with the culture of the organization. But it needs to be just a little gap. And then, then again, you, you grow in the organization. But you need to be very careful because people can learn skills. They can't change who they are. You can't change your personality. So it needs to be close, close enough anyway. 
But we've recruited, uh, uh, I mean, in, the, in Falcon Social today, we have more than 35 nationalities. So that tells you a lot about, uh, we get people from, you know, all over the world, and, and they're not all following the Danish culture. But I, I think the Danish culture in terms of flat hierarchy and, and really acceptance of uh, other people's qualities works very well for this. Yeah. And I'm not Danish. Yeah. One minute. What about uh, diversity then? I mean, if you're trying to fit everybody into one culture, don't you lose out on not having enough uh, diverse views? And, uh, we work a lot on the diversity uh, in Copenhagen, but for us it's natural in Copenhagen. But when, uh, when we open the US office, then you have the, the laws about being a diverse workforce, uh, and then it makes it much harder actually. It just put one strain on top of you to be able to find people that are following your culture and following your values, but that actually, you know, following the law uh, in terms of diversity that you have to apply in the US. But in Copenhagen, we have a very diverse workforce because it's a software company, and, and uh, you know, it would be a lie to say that uh, it's not. I think we had 64% guys, and the rest are women. Uh, and if I look at my HR department, I have only girls in my team, for instance. So those, those, uh, you know, those uh, ideas that uh, IT companies are mainly guys, it's true. But we try to really uh, emphasize uh, diversity. Thank you.